Wisdom and goodness to other people. Thank you all for being our teacher, calling us for the welfare of the society, the self government of the people. We ask that you draw near to our government and government. Remind them of their calling to serve for true common good. Help them to be instruments of unity, peace, and reconciliation in our federation throughout the world. May today's celebration promote your the kingdom for prosperity and Residents, may our leaders never turn aside from your will. May today's proceedings begin from you, and by you may it be brought to a complete succession. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I recognize the Honorable Member for St. Christopher Creek. Thank you, Madam Speaker. With your indulgence, I rise to seek <clears throat> or move a motion to have the Firearms Amendment Bill 2023 removed from the other paper under public business. Madam Speaker, I rise to second that request. Well, the question is that the bill, the Firearms Amendment Bill 2023, be removed from the order paper. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Confirmation of minutes. Minutes are deferred. Messages from the Governor General. There are no messages from the Governor General. Announcements by the Speaker. I have two. Firstly, I'd like to thank the honorable members for wearing hues of pink in observance of the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. This is an annual campaign to raise awareness of this complex issue and to show support for the many persons affected by breast cancer. This year's theme, No One Should Face Breast Cancer Alone, serves as a reminder for providers to consider the many ways they can partner with patients, and families in the prevention, detection, and treatment of breast cancer. So I want to thank the honorable members again. Secondly, and by way of apologies, I have correspondences from the honorable premier and the deputy speaker, Senator Jones, who will be absent during today's proceedings as they are executing national duties. Those are the notices for this morning. Presentation of papers and of reports from committees. Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honorable Member for St. Christopher 8. Thank you. Would you leave a rise to table before, um, place before this Honorable House. Uh, the Financial Services Regulatory Commission of St. Christopher Nevis, December 31st, 2022, um, expressed in Eastern Caribbean dollars. Petitions. 
government notices, unofficial notices, questions, requests for leave to move the adjournment of the National Assembly on matters of urgent public importance, statements by ministers. Madam Speaker, would you leave once again? I recognize the Honorable Member for St. Christopher 8. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Just very quickly, by way of update, uh, with respect to the ministries on the, uh, that, I, that I lead as the Minister. From the Ministry of Finance, um, just to update the people of St. Kitts and Nevis that we will be taking our budget on the road. And this week, um, Tuesday, we'll be going to the large community. And then later this week, we'll update the other village, but it will be in constituency number four. Um, Madam Speaker, as we said before, it is um, in keeping with the principles of good governance, premise on the principle of openness, transparency, inclusion, to make sure that the people of St. Kitts and Nevis would have a say, at least um, in the budget um, process. This is the, possibly the, one of the first times it is being done, and we intend to intensify it over the years as we go forward. We have already had um, a process where we had the youth of St. Kitts and Nevis meet with us um, at the Marriott um, Hotel, the ballroom area, where we engage in meaningful discussion as to the budget. And we heard from the youths of St. Kitts and Nevis, they made excellent suggestions, and many of them would have learned for the first time how the budget process really works. They also got an update as to the finances of their country, St. Kitts and Nevis. And so, building on that, we want to now take the budget out on the road so that our people in the villages and communities can have an opportunity to hear about where we are. We want to hear from them with respect to their suggestions and so forth so that we can have the best possible scenario in building out the budget for 2024. This is the initial stages of such action, but it's part of what we had promised the people and therefore we want to comply. When people get the opportunity to really participate in the whole democratic process from different perspectives, having their input gives us the best scenario to create a robust democracy and also to help to build out our sustainable island state. Madam Speaker, just by the Ministry of Health, by notice, the government has bought, has bought a brand new CT scan machine, 128 slice. I know that Nevis has 128 slice. So in this space of St. Kitts and Nevis, we would have two very modern CT scan machines. So just in case the one in Nevis goes down, they can come to St. Kitts. And if ours goes down, they can go over to Nevis. So we are building a more robust health sector um, here in the Federation of St. Kitts um, and Nevis. And not just on St. Kitts alone, but Nevis is also doing their part. And that message has been bought from Philips at a cost of 500,000 US dollars, a very reduced cost for it. And I want to thank our partners who have been contributing, who have contributed as well to make sure that this becomes a reality. And to this end, I will say the Ross um, School of Veterinary Medicine, um, their contribution went towards the purchasing of, of such a machine. It did not cover all, of course, but it did contribute to its purchase. And so I had spoken before about the MRI, which would serve both St. Kitts and Nevis. Nevis has a city, we have a city, so it gives us the best scenario. I've never spoken about it as a particular promise um, in any manifesto or anywhere, but of course, as you go and you govern, you look for opportunities to always create the best scenario for our people. And so we would have access to a very modern CT scan machine as well, which will be able to detect ischemic heart disease. What does that mean? If your heart arteries have blockages in them, 
instead of having to go on a treadmill necessarily, which is important at times, the CT scan machine is so um, so good that it can actually do it. The one in Nevis can actually do it if the protocols are set correctly. So that we know that heart disease is one of the leading causes of death here in St. Kitts and Nevis. And this machine would help us to detect early or detect critical cases and be able to intervene with the necessary treatment. To that end, I want to say, Madam Speaker, the reason why we have done this, we are now in the process of creating a cath lab. A cath lab is a lab where we can go into the arteries of your heart. I never spoke about this in the elections either, but this is something that we are building out. So we are partnering with a number of countries and, and developers. And I want to thank Dr. Laws, cardiologist, who is actually um, helping us to build this out. And we are hoping to have that cath lab built um, and sent to St. Kitts and Nevis. It would almost be uh, the plug in and ready to go so that we can create what you call a four minute city. What do we mean by a four minute city? That if you have chest pain anywhere in Bastia, we should be able to get you care within four minutes. So we're going to go through a robust um, education of the people of St. Kitts and Nevis and people in businesses and so forth. And we are also going to create what you call AEDs, automate, automated systems to resuscitate the heart. So if somebody were to collapse in here, those who work here should know how to use that machine. And it's only about an hour of training it takes for us to do that. So we want to be the first four-minute city in the Caribbean. And so we are building towards that as well. That would say to our tourists who come here that if anything were to happen to you, within four minutes, you have the best chance of survival. And so even though we didn't talk about it, this is part of that revolution in healthcare that we want to create. Are there issues in health? Yes, because we are shifting the culture, shifting what we deliver making it as modern as possible. And in creating that um, four-minute city, we want to also partner with Nev in Nevis. So anybody goes to Nevis, we want to also be able to help them to get that care, get to sink it quickly, and get into a cath lab if needs be. This is going to help us tremendously as we build towards a new hospital. As I've said, it is not just about building a new structure, but the services must be modern, and we must see the outcome being better quality of life um, for our people. On that, Madam Speaker, we have also promoted six nurses to become nurse managers. So we have created six more positions of nurse managers because we think that this creates the best scenario to manage the different wards at the hospital. And at this time, I want to congratulate the six nurses who have gotten, they went through a process of interviews, a rigorous process. A committee was put together, a panel, and then they were scored, and the scores were shared with all those who participated for openness and transparency. Of course, with anything you do, you always you can't satisfy every single person or every single scenario. But I always believe if we were to do it in an open and transparent way, that at the end of the day, having that as a cornerstone on which you moved forward with this process, that will create a sense of, look, I have accomplished, and the process was open and transparent, and I would have another opportunity. And the reason why we did this is that nurses were not moving up enough. We had a lot of, a lot of nurses who are professionals, who have gotten their degrees, and so we wanted also, apart from better management, better outcome, which are the most important, to give the professionals an opportunity to move up. But not as a hand-picking scenario, but based on how you perform. So it doesn't depend on your age and those type of things. It depends on your competency and your ability to really um, produce um, in this space. And so we have done that. And so I want to congratulate those six nurses as we continue to build out not just the physical infrastructure in health, but in terms of the management structure and human resource um, enhancement to make sure that we become what we want to, to come when it comes to the delivery of health. I also want to update um, the, the country and the renal transplant program, we had our another meeting last week where we brought all um, together and Dr. Patrick Martin, the advisor, and Dr. Ted Hanley, who is over our accreditation process, they are leading on this. And so we are going to set up our program in short order where we'll be offering um, renal transplant in St. Kitts and Nevis. Not just for St. Kitts and Nevis, but we want to offer it to the other countries around why is it we are doing this? There are a number of young people, Madam Speaker, who have end-stage renal disease, which means that they're on dialysis. We know what is the life expectancy on dialysis. We know the quality of life that one has to go through while they're on dialysis. The best scenario is renal transplant. Why? Renal transplant is cheaper. 
Well, let's put that secondary. The first thing, renal transplant, you live much longer and a better quality of life. You don't need dialysis, and you can go back to your normal life. That's the first scenario. Secondly, it is cheaper than dialysis. Dialysis over an eight-year period is extremely expensive compared to a renal transplant for multiple decades. And so, from all perspective, renal transplant it is the best scenario we can have once you need treatment. But of course, we believe in prevention. That is why we are saying to our people, exercise, eat well. Those two things, if you can't do anything else, there are a number of other things you can do. But eating well does not mean eat fancy. Sometimes it means eat less of what you have. More fruits, more vegetables. You can save money in St. Kitts and Nevis if you eat better, you know, Madam Speaker. Instead of two spoonfuls of rice, eat one. So you have another spoonful for the next day. Instead of having fried chicken, two fried chicken, have a one steamed chicken. It's enough food. It's just that in St. Kitts and Nevis, Food is abundant and we overeat. And so, all of us, <laughs> so I want to encourage all of us to cut back on how much we really consume. All of us can do better, oh, including me. <laughs> 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 and that will make a significant difference. Instead of drinking juice, and I'm not the senior doctor on the team, my senior colleague is right here. I think he would have spoken about that multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> well, portion is important. You can have a small glass, of course, but you know, you think it's, you have to be careful when you say glass, because you know, this is a glass, you know. <laughs> and therefore, I want to encourage us really to watch how much we consume and what we consume. Instead of having a big glass of orange juice, you can have a glass of water. It is much cheaper than a glass of orange juice, and it is healthier. And then I want us to really start to exercise. If you, it's a way you live, you walk home from work a few days per week. But I'm coming with a revolutionary plan that I'm going to first implement at the government headquarters to see how we can really incorporate exercise as part of the work day. Because we are thinking if we are able to do that, it can transform people's lives and cut down on the astronomical cost of healthcare. But most importantly, save lives and give people a better quality of life as well. So renal transplant um, program is well on the way, and we will include that. It's something that I never really spoke about on the campaign trail. Again, not everything that you would have spoken about, but we had opportunities. Once you meet what the reality is, one has to adjust accordingly. I want to update that children continue to benefit from the Children's Fund. As you know, we put that Children's Health Fund in place. No child in St. Kitts or Nevis should die because their parents don't have money to get them the care that they need. That will not happen under us. A number of children from across the Federation have already benefited, and they continue um, to benefit. So I want to say to mothers and fathers and guardians out there, if you have a child who is so sick that needs attention overseas, if you don't know where to go, you can contact the Prime Minister's office. We want to give that child the best opportunity to live. Many children have survived with heart problems that they would have died in the past. The children are alive and robust and running around and so forth. Because some of, many of these issues can be resolved with surgery. Just that in the past, many parents did not have access to the resources. And therefore, we want to eliminate that. Whether they have cancers at a young age, heart problems at a young age, kidney problems at a young age, whatever the scenario is, and they need to go overseas to save their lives, do not hesitate to make contact. And if nobody answers the phone, come down Church Street and say, you want to see the Prime Minister call me child sick. You got permission to do that. That's the permission I'll give the population when their child is in very difficult circumstances and they need immediate help to save the child's life. And parents have walked into the office. They have come. They say, I want to see the prime minister because my child is sick and they need to go overseas. And they have received the help and children are alive as a result of that. Uh, Madam Speaker, from the Ministry of National Security, as you know, last week the task force of dealing with violence from a public health perspective met. In that meeting, we had advisors such as Dr. Isben Williams, who is one of the lead experts in the Caribbean on this matter, who had been sounding the call for many, many years about the violence in the Caribbean that can erupt if we don't deal with it at its base level, or its foundation. And therefore, it, 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 we are putting it together. I want to thank him, of course, for his expertise, and he's now putting the action plan together. I want to thank Dr. Patrick Martin as a pediatrician who also was on the same page with Dr. Isbin Williams, who is a psychiatrist, of how we can do it. I want to say that we also had 
from Ministry of National Security, Education, Health, and so forth. This is not just national security. We are dealing with human security. National security is just a part of it. So we are going to deal with this issue comprehensively once and for all. Why? The World Bank did a study, and of course the former Prime Minister is here, Dr. Denzel Douglas, and he knows about that study. That study was done years ago because CARICOM had asked the World Bank to study violence in the Caribbean. They studied it deeply, in depth, and they put forward the scientific recommendations. So we are not guessing. We know what it takes to deal with the issue of human security over a long period of time. We have the solution. We are now going to move to implement the solution. Because we are so blessed to have one of the leading experts in the Caribbean, Dr. Isben Williams, and this one, who was the guest speaker in Trinidad for the CARICOM um, some months ago, where I also had the opportunity to speak. We want to create the model in St. Kitts and Nevis and be able to ask the rest of CARICOM to see what we do. Why are we in a position to do it? Because, of course, Dr. William, Dr. Isben Williams, you have persons like Dr. Patrick Martin, we have advisor Dr. Powell, whose expertise is in citizen and human security. We have the NSA as well, Dr. Um, Dr. Rollins, and then we have our commissioner, PSs for the various ministries. So we have the network to really bring this, um, bring this together. And so we are going to have two symposiums, at least one of them for sure, before Christmas, to invite the rest of society to have a discussion on it as we put the framework together. And as we put the framework together to really start implementing that framework to once and for all deal with the issue in the Caribbean. And so I will take over, um, God's willing, the leadership of CARICOM in 2025. And so that will be part of my platform. How can I help to implement this across the region? Why this is so important? Because if you look at the issue of human security across the region, we saw an increase or spike after COVID, which was partly um, predicted. But we also know that parts of this were implemented in areas in Central America and so forth. So the actual evidence is also there to show the outcome once implemented. And they saw a significant drop in interpersonal violence, which is one of them is gang crime and so forth. So it has already been tested and proven. One of the other places it was implemented is in Colombia, where a bad area was converted into a tourist attraction when they started to implement the program, which also helped, to some extent, some people believe, to bring the war in factions over time as the society began to change, to come together to deal with the issue of human security. So it's not just national security or citizen security, it is also the issue of human security, which is a much broader topic, so we have to deal with it from a comprehensive perspective, and we'll deal with it scientifically and invest in it and implement it um, for our people. However. We know that we have a period of challenges that, challenge that we have to pass through. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, and nobody can sugarcoat it anywhere in the Caribbean. We have to deal with it as a region, and we are going to take the lead on it. And maybe because I'm a medical doctor by training, it so happen, happened that I understand, based on my training, nothing special, exactly what this is seeking to do. And I think at this time, St. Kitts and Nevis had been blessed to have the most doctors in CARICOM as Prime Ministers. And so this allows us to be uniquely positioned, just as the former Prime Minister brought the issue of HIV AIDS and dealt with it um, from his perspective as a Prime Minister and doctor to benefit the whole of the Caribbean. And that would have saved so many lives. He himself don't even know how many lives have been saved. Right? He'd been so busy in politics, he didn't check his medical stats. <laughs> but hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved as a result of that. And we intend to lead on this also so that we can save tens of thousands of lives here in the, in the Caribbean. Um, I also want to say that if you look today, we amended the, the, the order paper and we took that one out because we're going to do a broad consultation and bring a sweeping set of changes together so that it is balanced and all make sense. And so that is why we did that. Um, and lastly, um, I will say from the office of the Prime Minister, well, human resource perspective, we are now in discussions about creating a civil servant institute. What does that mean? Because we hear over the years um, the issues with the civil service, and that I'm not going to sugarcoat. We are trying to deal with it robustly in terms of training and so forth and customer service, but we are going to set up an institute 
which would formalize to a great extent the training that civil servants have to go through to be a part of the civil service. And that type of training would result, we think, um, in better service um, to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis who so deserve it. So we are on the pathway for that as well. So Madam Speaker, I just wanted to update us on that this morning. There are many other things to update on, but I will leave it here. So with you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Are there any other statements? Personnel explanations. Motions relating to the business of the National Assembly and moved by a minister. Public business. Bills, second reading. I recognize the Honorable Member for St. Christopher Six. Yes, Madam Speaker, I rise again. And with your leave, and on the section of the order paper that deals with um, public business, Bill's second reading, I like, of course, to have read in this house for the second time. The bill surely entitled the Consumer Protection Bill 2023, and which would have had its first reading on the 18th of September this year, when we would have just before Independence 40th anniversary had brought this bill into being in this house. The Consumer Protection Bill comes before us from the Ministry of International Trade, Industry, Commerce, and Consumer Affairs because it is very strongly believed that with all that is happening around us in the world, with the changes in prices of goods related, of course, to very many different reasons, there is more and more an urgency for consumers to be protected and also at the same time encourage those who are in business to work with consumers to ensure that at the end of the day, both sides of the equation would benefit. I emphasize that this bill seeks to provide for the promotion and the protection of consumer interests. In relation to the supply of goods and the provision of services, and to ensure that there is appropriate protection of life, of health and safety of consumers. It is to ensure that there is established a consumer affairs department, or maybe I would say a revisiting of the consumer affairs department in the ministry I've just mentioned and also for other purposes, this bill is bringing into being the consumer protection in another phase in this long history of supporting 
consumers and their rights and interests all along. I want to emphasize that the bill is replacing the Consumer Affairs Act, Chapter 18.38, which was published as an act, as Act 9, I should say, back in 2003, and which was brought into force in this assembly on the 8th day of December 2003. In other words, 20 long years ago. The Consumer Affairs Department, in fact, was legally constituted in 2003 through the passage of the Consumer Protection Act of 2003. And this act provided at that time the legal framework that will ultimately guide the officers therein on how to conduct the daily functioning of the department. Additionally, it highlighted the legislative scope of the Department of Consumer Affairs and the way in which the department should be structured in order to function as a quasi-court, a quasi-court for consumer protection issues. But Madam Speaker, over the last 20 years of the existence of this department, many internal deficiencies have been identified as contributing factors that would, have happened, that would have hampered the ability of the department in performing its duties effectively and efficiently. Today, we are here in this parliament to debate the Consumer Protection Bill 2023, which is envisaged to give officers of the Consumer Affairs Department more legislative authority, or as we would commonly say, more teeth in order to accomplish their daily task as consumer protection officers. There was a time when we had um, price control officers. That's no longer used. The system has been changed as a result of appropriate legislative action. And so when we from time to time recognize that prices would have moved on the shelves from one day to the next, or from one week to the next, or one month to the next, we would commonly say, well, what is happening with these price control officers? Don't they see that the prices are going up every day and they're doing nothing? Price control officers do not exist and would not have existed for quite a while. But instead, as I said, they were put in place consumer protection officers, but we recognize that they could not function at peak and with highest efficiency because there were some legislative lacunae which prevented them from really operating the way that they should. I notice you like the word lacunae. <laughs> 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 but the act will therefore now be replaced by this harmonized bill which is before us today. The enactment of harmonized consumer protection legislation 
in the sub-region that is the OECS member states is very, very important in light of the onset of the CARICOM single market and single economy. In this new environment, the OECS member states are required to move away from exchange controls and price controls and to move towards what we call a liberalized market. Now, this piece of legislation is, as I said, a revision of what would have been the old act. In fact, part two of chapter eight, which of course make reference to articles 184 of the legislation, 184 to 186 of the legislation of the revised Treaty of Chagaranas, which would have established the Caribbean community, including the single market and economy. Member states specifically in that piece of document, member states are required to promote and to protect the interest of consumers in the community by appropriate measures. And in Article 185 in particular of the revised treaty of Chagaramas, it provided member states with, or in fact I said it provides that member states shall act in a harmonized legislative framework that is aimed at protecting the consumers of St. Kitts and Nevis as, of course, the consumers of the rest of the sub-region. And so, Madam Speaker, the CARICOM Secretariat has therefore provided model consumer protection legislation for all of the member states of CARICOM and the OECS Secretariat has dutifully tailored that model legislation to better meet the needs of the OECS member states within the wider CARICOM um, region. And this model legislation has been further tailored to meet the specific national policy the needs of our people here in St. Kitts and Nevis in this our federation. In this regard, I want to thank the, um, the chambers of the Attorney General and the relative um, legislative attorneys, draft attorneys, who have been working on this piece of legislation for some time. And I'm pleased that we are now in a position, after consultation with the ministry and with the appropriate stakeholders, we are now able to come to parliament today and ensure that this new piece of legislation is brought into the arsenal of the laws of St. Kitts and Nevis to be better protectors of the people's interest, especially those who are consuming a number of items and are the recipient of certain services. And so the Consumer Protection Bill takes into account part two of chapter eight of the revised Treaty of Chagaramas and in accordance with article 186, it provides for the following policy objectives, which if you would allow me, Madam Speaker, I would go through now. What are these policy objectives? One, the fundamental terms of a contract and the implied obligations of parties to a contract for the supply of goods or services. It is 
more so now a contractual arrangement between the two parties. Number two, it also is intended to achieve the objective of the prohibition of the inclusion of unconscionable terms in contracts for the sale and supply of goods or services to our consumers. Three, another objective is the prohibition of unfair trading practices, particularly such practices that relate to misleading or deceptive or fraudulent conduct. Four, the prohibition of production and supply of harmful and defective goods and for the adoption of measures to prevent the supply or sale of such goods, including measures requiring the removal of defective goods from the marketplace, from the shelves, from wherever the market is. Common complaint that we would have had that consumer protection officers under the old legislation, the visit, the identify goods that they believe with good reason are defective. Those goods are ordered off the shelves, but we have to wait until the appropriate officer in a different ministry comes and removes them. By the time they come, they go on back on the shelves, and so the consumer is not protected. That will come to an end. This is to ensure that when defective goods are removed from the market, they are removed. Another one, another important objective, number five, is the provision of services in compliance with the applicable regulations, with the standards, with the codes, and the licensing requirements. Six, that goods which are supplied to consumers, that they are appropriately labeled in accordance with the standards and specifications prescribed by the competent authorities. We have seen that the date of expiration of goods removed, that, is have, that will have to come to an end. The objective is to ensure that the consumer is protected by ensuring that the date is there. There are certain chemicals which we understood, they have devised, that if you apply, it removes the date. That will come to an end. When this piece of legislation, the Consumer Protection Act or bill, is put into effect. Good supply to consumers are properly labeled in accordance with the standards and specifications prescribed by the competent authorities. And the objective of this act that we have before us in Parliament today is to ensure that that is maintained. Number seven, another important objective is that hazardous or other goods whose distribution and consumption are regulated by law are sold or supplied in accordance with applicable regulations. If it does not have appropriate markings, if they are not properly um, dated, if they are not properly described in the distribution, we have to ensure that if the law says that they are supposed to be so marked and identified that they would have to be. Otherwise, 
This would be a regulation that is in fact violated and the law would then take its course. We want to make sure as another, that another objective is attained and that is that goods or materials, the production or use of which is likely to result in potentially harmful environmental effects that they are labeled and supplied in accordance with applicable standards and regulations. We want to make sure that goods which can have harmful and environmental effects, that they are so labeled and they are, up, they are in fact supplied in a particular way according to specifications. This objective if it is not achieved, when consumers are out there doing business, then the law will kick in and we will have some action in the court of law. Another important objective, Madam Speaker, is that producers and suppliers are liable for defects in goods and for violation of product standards and consumer safety standards which occasion loss or damage to consumers. This also is very, very important. If I bought a good particular product from a particular supplier and it caused me to be sick and I am certain that it came from there, you are liable violated my health and you shall pay. This is very, very important for protection of our consumers. Another important objective, Madam Speaker, that we wish to attain by this new piece of legislation is that violations of consumer safety standards by producers or suppliers are appropriately sanctioned and relevant civil or criminal defenses to such violations are available to defendants. So if there's a poor boy, a poor woman, an elderly, she ain't got no money to go to a lawyer to ensure that her rights as a consumer are protected, this loss is this law we will put into place today says that she should be able to be provided with available legal support and defendants of what she thinks would be her right, her claim, I should say, for that right that would have been violated. So, Madam Speaker, permit me now to highlight a few salient features of the bill, apart from the objectives I've just gone through. If it is enacted into law, and I hate to think that the opposition will not support this bill. So if enacted into law, and I can say when enacted into law, this bill will be applicable to all persons involved in trade and commerce whether through purchasing or supplying of goods or services, and the bill would also be binding on the crowd. Binding on the crowd. That is, government, of course, is bound to be involved in such transactions. The Consumer Protection Board, therefore, will be established and its specific functions will include the conducting, it's going to help me, um, may not find the appropriate section. <laughs> the, the, the board making reference specific. Right. Functions of the board, section eight. Right, so the Consumer Protection Board will be established according to this piece of legislation. And its functions will include the conducting of investigations 
on behalf of consumers adversely affected in relation to the sale of goods or provision of services in order to determine whether they were sold or provided in contravention of this act. So that is why I said that one of the important pieces that was missing from the previous bill or law was that it did not act as a quasi-judicial body. This today is different. It will act as a quasi-judicial quasi, um, body by way of the Consumer Protection Board being properly put in place. What does it say about the board? Let me go through this first. Right. And the board will be established, as I said, and its functions will include the conducting of investigations. Investigations on behalf of consumers who have been adversely affected in relation to the sale of goods or services which they would have obtained in order to determine whether there was really a violation of the act and whether a claim by one who would have been violated is established or not. Now, and as a result of this investigation that would have been done, there would be certain specific recommendations that are made to the minister promoting the development of consumer organizations and resolving disagreements between consumers and vendors or service providers. The bill provides, therefore, for the procedure for investigation of complaints by the board or the department responsible for consumer affairs, and the board will be empowered to summon persons. That is why we said at the beginning, it is now a quasi-judicial body. It is empowered to behave as if it is a court. And this empowerment has come from this new piece of legislation. And therefore, it can summon persons to give evidence for the purposes of investigation. If the young man was asked to remove the date or tamper with certain specific guidelines on the product, he can be brought to the court of the board and confirms the accusation and thus would provide the necessary evidential support for a decision to be taken in order to protect the consumer and at the same time give such strong warning or action against the person who would have provided that particular product. Therefore, here is where, as I said, the Consumer Protection Bill of today, it has teeth. Present consumer officers, they go, they say, this is not right, do this, do that. Fellas, them laugh at them, they don't have no power. Now they have power being brought into this parliament through this piece of legislation that becomes law after it is passed today and the opposition dare not support it. They must support it today for it to become law. <laughs> so it provides the procedure for investigation, but it also goes on. The bill imposes obligations on vendors, on service providers, 
and consumers in relation to goods sold or services provided. For example, a vendor or a provider is under an, ob an obligation to provide information as to the origin, the price, the care, where was it stored, what are the conditions of storage, was it stored with rats and dogs and cockroaches. These are important matters that will now come to play as we try to protect our consumers and ensure that there's a harmonious relationship between the consumer and the provider of goods and services. So it, the, the, the provider is under an obligation to provide information as to the origin. Now, if you smuggle it, where you get it from? You can't have smuggled goods on your shelves. If you do what we know, when you talk about Beris the singer, if it appears on the shelf, where you get that from? These are the important questions that the consumer protection officer can now ask and must get answers in order to protect those who are being provided with these products. So that is why it is important to say where it came from, the terms, etc., of the goods being sold. Thank you. Right. The vendor or service provider is also under obligation to provide receipts and warrants. You know how many people sell stolen goods? Huh? You know how many people sell stolen watches and rings and chains? Huh? You know how many people do that? And we are saying that when there is reason for the consumer protection officer to ask questions to ascertain the origin, they are expected to be given appropriate answers according to this piece of legislation that is here before us today. Madam Speaker, the bill also will prohibit vendors or service providers from committing a number of offenses, including misleading or deceptive conduct, misleading the public as to the nature of goods and the non-delivery of goods. This is important. You buy something, you don't purchase it. It's there to be delivered two months after the guy sold it again, maybe three times he don't sell it. These things must come to an end. Not everybody doing that, but those who do it. Just last week, a lady was telling me she paid for some things, and up to now we didn't receive. But the weather was bad. So I said, maybe it's the weather. I hope it's the weather. You understand? So these are practices that sound simple. Everyday simple things, but the consumer must now know he can make noise. He can do something if he believes that he is not receiving what he expects to receive after completing the transaction on his end with the, with the provider of the important service or the goods to be delivered. So the bill prohibits vendors or service providers from committing a number of offenses, including misleading or deceptive conduct, misleading the public as to the nature of goods and the non-delivery of goods as well. Madam Speaker, the Board and the Consumer Affairs Department will be responsible for the administration of the bill. Currently, the Consumer Affairs Department is the only agency or consumer advocacy within the Federation, and it has 
endeavored to remain true to its mandate of ensuring that the rights of consumers are protected and appropriately defended. In this regard, consumers have consistently been educated, informed, and empowered to make more knowledgeable business decisions in the marketplace through the utilization of various outreach platforms, including radio and television interviews, town hall meetings, and the dissemination of information via the department Facebook page. We are determined to ensure that the consuming public is educated. You know how many people go and get a topper? Twenty dollars topper. After use for a few minutes, the money gone. No, seriously. But we don't know that this is a serious violation. This is happening almost every day. But I thought I had a top up for $20. It's only $5 use you get of telecom time. That is robbery. I won't say highway robbery. Because it's not highways. Telephone robbery. But these are things that I am saying to the public you must become, become conscious of. Make sure the money that you are spending to get a service, that you receive it. Because this law we are passing today is insisting that you not only have the right, but we in the department, in the ministry, have the right to educate you on these matters, and we will continue to do so using all of the media outlets that are available to us. It is in keeping with the mandate of educating the masses that in 2023, the Consumer Education for Kids pilot program was launched. Where do you think it was launched? At St. Paul's Primary School. At Sadler's, you remember? Those of you who were paying attention. And also, eventually, that same afternoon, at the Dr. William Connor Primary School. And the objective was to bring the importance of consumer protection to the kids in their very early stage. That they understand. There was a quiz. There was also a quiz at Kunai. The, the, the evening, we had a quiz at Kunai. And who won? I wish to have won. That is true. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I to have won. That is, a, that is a fact. And it's in keeping with this mandate that we are bringing the learning, the knowledge, the information, to the kids so that they can help their households in, in being protected from those who may be, may be unscrupulous and are providing um, goods and services which are not in keeping with the contractual arrangement made by the consumer and the provider of the goods or services. Additionally, I want to make the point very quickly that a key objective of this program is to encourage students to share their own newfound knowledge with their family and friends. And since the launch of this particular pilot program, the Consumer Affairs Department has engaged in discussions with the Ministry of Education and its <laughs> curriculum the development unit in order to further discuss having this particular program become a fixture within, a fixture within the curriculum of all 
our primary schools. After having the proposed lesson plans vetted by the school, by the social studies curriculum and coordinators within the Ministry of Education, I want to report that this new initiative has already been given the green light to be taught at the primary school level during social studies classes for the 2024 academic year. Apart from that, in educating the public, part of the mandate given to the Consumer Affairs Department involves conducting inspections at various businesses in order to safeguard the rights of consumers and to ensure compliance with consumer protection law relating to pricing, labeling, and of course, food safety. The inspections are primarily focused on identifying expired goods, items in dented cans or damaged packaging, freezer burnt items, and items lacking English labels. You're not supposed to buy anything unless you can read the language in which it is written. If you're not Chinese and you can't speak Chinese, then make sure you look for the English labeling on the goods. A lot of Spanish-speaking people are here, but it's not all of us who speak Spanish or read Spanish. So if you're bringing in the goods from Colombia or Argentina or wherever, make sure not only consumers, but those who are doing the orders, make sure that the goods you are bringing into the country for consumption by our people that they are in the language that the people can understand. That is the language of English. Separate exercises are conducted. I'm going to come back to that because once we can attain the sustainable island state, we will become bilingual. I had the opportunity last week in the Bahamas had a bilateral with the um, the Minister of um, Investment, etc., from the Dominican Republic. And that's one of the things we said. We want to make sure that they can speak English, and we want to make sure we can speak Spanish. So we have ask for some Spanish speaking teachers to come here and help our kids at the primary school level. When I was going to high school those days, grammar school, you started Spanish only in third form. And Spanish was an alternative to biology. When I became a doctor, so I did the right thing. I went to the biology, but it deprived me of Spanish. So we want to make sure that we are bilingual here in St. Kitts and Nevis. We'll hear more about that. So I want to make the point that separate exercises are going to be conducted for the main purpose of collecting price data, which is essential in maintaining a detailed pricing database for all basket items sold at the 46 large and medium-sized supermarkets across St. Kitts and Nevis. We want to make sure that they have, the consumer protection officers have access to all 46 major, large to medium supermarkets across St. Kitts. They are therefore going to come in and conduct the appropriate exercises to ensure that the bill 
and its specific objectives are being attained as a result of applying certain guidelines which are to be applied by the consumer protection officers in visiting the establishments. For the year to date, approximately 21,000 items have been removed from business shelves. Is that a lot? Maybe it should be four times that. But so far, the statistics that we have indicate that 21,000 items have been removed from business shelves and syndicates during these inspections which are carried out. This alarming statistic highlights a lack of compliance exhibited by many of our businesses. The department has been diligent in its efforts to educate and advise business owners about the importance of adhering to these laws. But it appears that without the proper ability to penalize, that's why we needed this legislation. It needed to be given teeth and power because it needs the ability to penalize non-compliant businesses. And there continue to be a continuous blatant disregard for consumer protection practices simply because they know that these young ladies who visit them and the young men who visit them as protection officers, that they have no power as such to do anything except hoping that they, the business people, will comply with what they are asking. And so the passage of this bill would really better empower the Consumer Affairs Department to strictly enforce and uphold the outlined consumer protection framework contained in this bill. Additionally, Madam Speaker, the implementation of fines and penalties will serve as a crucial deterrent, ensuring that more businesses fall in line with consumer protection laws and prioritize consumer safety. We will ensure that all parties are appropriately educated. There can be no excuse that, well, we didn't know the law. You must know the law. We will help you to know the law. But if you are going to be selling services and goods to the public, before you start to sell, know the law. You have an obligation to know the law. I believe that not only, therefore, must be the must, that we must have the providers knowing the law, but those who are our officers protecting consumers must know the law. We will make changes. We will make sure that the um, department is not a dumping ground. We want to emphasize that. It will not be a dumping ground. It must have officers who can execute what the law says. We will train those who at the moment need to be trained. And those who are trainable will be trained. And what we need, therefore, are trainable officers so that they can understand what their roles and responsibilities so that they can effectively protect our consumers and give current and support and execution 
of this piece of legislation. For years, a lot of complaints about price gouging and so forth and so forth. This, of course, is going to help with that particular accusation. Because, as we understand it, to be frank, the prices of goods are moving almost with every shipment of goods that come in. It is not that we have unscrupulous, all of them, I don't think so, businessmen who want to have the whole hog and half of the next hog. Is that language parliamentary, Madam Speaker? I am sure it is understood by the ordinary man. So, <laughs> Madam Speaker, in other words, when the price goes on a product that has been put on the shelves, we expect that the price has been determined as a result of the import cost, genuine import cost, genuine import cost, and the markup, which is allowed by law, imposed, of course, set by the government. Anything out of that is price gouging, and we're going to come after them. Once the businessman is keeping within the law, this is the price of the good, the document, that is what I bought it for. This is what it cost me to transport it. This is what it cost me to ensure that it comes here. Once that has been put into the equation, together with your profit margin, the markup that the government says you're allowed. Of course, you could go below that because you're competing with your neighbor, next businessman next to you. But you can go above what the government says is the marker. So the price of the goods, what you bought it for, we know that the price of the goods, it changes almost with every shipment because there's so much problems with disrupting supply chains, things that used to take maybe two weeks or two months to come from China, it take in five months, nearly a year. And the cost goes up. So the price gouging that we hear about, that is what really is not the only concern. It is you, the consumer. Look at some of the things that I have mentioned, making sure that the businessman is complying with what the law says. And the consumer protection officer doing his job properly to ensure that the consumer is protected. Madam Speaker, I believe that with the measures that will be instrumental in ensuring the continued integrity of the department's consumer protection efforts and with the best practices of our law compliant businessmen and with the consumer public being highly educated and has a watchful eye and pays attention to what service or what good, what goods he or she would be purchasing, I believe that with the continued integrity of the department's consumer protection efforts, 
and the enhancement of the way in which business is conducted within the Federation, this piece of legislation, the Consumer Protection Bill of 2023, is going to be a landmark piece of legislation in St. Gibson News. May it please you, Madam Thank you to the Honorable Member for St. Christopher Six, mover of the bill. Is there another presenter? I recognize the Honorable Senator, Dr. Clark. Oh, this one. <laughs> Greetings, Madam Speaker. I'm always pleased for the opportunity to lend support to legislative changes which allow us as a government to meet our regional commitments. In particular, this piece of legislation which allows us to protect more wholesomely the rights of all consumers. Apologies, Madam Speaker. I should also note, thank you. Thank you so much. I should also note, Madam Speaker, that our good governance agenda is tightly aligned with the legislative calendar that our Attorney General has proposed. And more importantly, the legislative agenda prepares a very solid base for the transition of our country to a sustainable island state. This is not premised solely on environmental matters, but how we can live and thrive and transact business more sustainably, how we sell, buy, and survive in St. Kitts with responsible consumption. As such, I'm happy today to be able to speak not just to the legislative changes for the Consumer Protection Bill, but to provide a framework of how these changes can support the diversity of consumers in St. Kitts and Nevis, whether you are visually impaired, young, old, rural, urban, whether you can read really well or cannot read, whether you can calculate maths really fast in your mind or not, and how the government the consumers and the suppliers can work together to ensure the safety and survivability of all when we consume products. As outlined by the mover of the bill, the changes that we're debating today are really premised on trust and trust building and something that we often take for granted. When consumers can step into a store and can trust that their suppliers are providing them with quality products, with products that are as labeled on the packaging, with products that are not expired, and with products that are not against environmental regulations or chemical regulations, it must be based on trust. I must trust that my dollar that I spend in a store for item A is the same that person who went in, in a store before me, it's the same dollar, it's the same quality, it's the same value. I think also part of the breakdown in trust for consumers in St. Kitts, and I can speak on my own behalf, is entering some stores, and I'm happy that the legislation addresses this. You enter a store, Madam Speaker. There are no signs. There's no sign which says no refund. There's no sign which says no card payment below $20. Thank God that's no longer legal to even say. There's no sign which says no exchange. Yet you purchase something, you step out, and maybe for some of us, you step into an next on your seat for like $5 cheap and you want to go back and get your money. Ah, oh, you change your mind. And you go to the store. Oh, sorry, miss, we don't exchange. What? Where's the sign? What do you mean you don't exchange? What do you mean I can't get my money back? These legislative changes will make it very clear to consumers 
what their rights are regarding a supplier saying you cannot exchange your good, you cannot get your money back, because that is not right. It is not fair, of course, not to the supplier and not just to the consumer, but also for supplier and consumer relations. There must be clarity on what stores can say for refund policies, for exchange policies, and thankfully, there are no more minimum card purchase requirements in saying I'm correct in saying that right AG because that is a notice I saw right as it relates to global penetration and importance of making these legislative changes we must also recognize that while we are trying to protect the consumer in St. Kitts and Nevis there is also a need for us to standardize regularize and harmonize our legislation not just with CARICOM regulations and regional regulations, but also to meet international market requirements. International market penetration and our ability to attract increased investments is directly linked to the update of our legislation, critical pieces like the Consumer Protection Bill. We must therefore comply with international trade norms, which facilitate cooperation, growth, and empowerment. And importantly, linked to this global penetration is allowing for innovative solutions to enter our marketplace. Oftentimes, we travel, we return, and we wonder, why isn't this in St. Kitts? Why can't we have this innovation? We can, but with innovation comes a need to protect the innovators, the entrepreneurs, and the consumers. So, I am very pleased that this piece of legislation also allows for this level of protection for our entrepreneurs as well as our consumers. As it relates to safety, Madam Speaker, this goes beyond just ensuring that, and I'm not trivializing it, ensuring that expired packages are removed from a shelf. Now, for example, if you are like me, and I am certain that there are many persons like me, I cannot purchase a piece of item without checking the expiration date a hundred times. I don't know why I do it. And I'll refer to one of my favorite snacks, which happens to be <laughs> quick crackers, especially when it is raining, right? Quick. <laughs> But Madam Speaker, the worst, the worst experience I've ever had in my life is you go in and you blindly take up a pack of quicks and you get home and you shower and you put on your tea. I know it sounds like I'm geriatric, but still, you, you put on your tea, you have your little cheese or whatever, and you take the quicks and you bite it and the quicks steal. <laughs> it really ruins it really ruins your night because this is your favorite snack and it goes the same for if you like a Doritos or anything that's made, whether it's local, the planting chips, you do not want to go to the hassle of going in the supermarket only to get home to realize the crackers steal. And where does the legislation come into play here as so eloquently explained by the move of the bill? It's not just don't put the expired goods on the shelf or removing them. It's destruction. Get rid of the goods so that people don't put them in the back here. We're going to throw them away. And then they end up on the shelf. It's destroying the goods and having the power, the officers having the power to demand the destruction. I want to also reference constant monitoring and removal that goes a little bit further. If you've never visited the landfill, I want to open your eyes, not in a negative way, but this is the reality. And garbage picking is something that's more common in bigger countries. And in terms of countries where the poverty is very acute, especially around the landfill. And there are times when I've visited, not just in my capacity as minister, but when I was an educator and you take students to the landfill. And one of the most shocking experiences students had was 
the garbage pickers who are waiting on the truck, and I won't call any supplier's truck, to dump the, the um, expired unused goods. And these garbage pickers pick them. And a few of them would be like, teacher, but she does sell down the road. What's she doing here? So you cannot confirm in some cases, if you're consuming goods that just had a three mile drive to the landfill and then a five mile drive back to somebody's kitchen. That is where destruction of expired goods is so critical to protecting the consumer because I know many of us would feel sick to the stomach if you knew that you were consuming goods that spent an entire day in, in someone's warehouse defrosting, went to the landfill, tumbled up with the garbage, picked out, and then seasoned and cooked for you. You would have a problem, but we have to protect the consumer. Importantly, there is a need to speak to safety as it relates to hazardous chemicals, environmental regulations, and trust around what's on a label. If we do not know what's in our food, we will be consuming, as our Prime Minister mentioned in his updates by ministers, a lot of things that are just hazardous to our bodies. If we are going to get to the point where suppliers and even persons who cook and prepare meals and sell meals are forced even to state how much sugar is in your drink, how much um, the carbs, the calories, etc., everything that's in your food, so you understand that what you're putting in your mouth is directly linked to your health, then we would have more responsible consumption. Then we are going to say that we are speaking towards our SDGs and sustainable island state. The more information we have as consumers, the better we are able to protect ourselves. I must, as I said in my early statement, contextualize this around our transition to a sustainable island state. The Consumer Protection Bill speaks to three SDGs. SDG 3, Good Health and Well-Being. SDG 9, Industry, Innovation and Infrastructure. But most importantly, it is directly linked to SDG 12, Responsible Consumption and Production. If we have to adhere to environmental changes and environmental protocols, if we have to adhere rather to transparency around reporting and food claims to avoid dangerous items and ban chemicals or to be clear when we're talking about eco-conscious economic activities that someone cannot green wash and green label and say that this is good for your health this is going to make your hair grow back this is going to make you lose weight in five seconds they say <laughs> they say these things they say these things on packaging, on things that you order, on things that are sold in stores, or this is going to give you vitality and energy so that you can last hours and hours doing, doing schoolwork. <laughs> the packaging and the labeling must match what items can do. Right? So, <laughs> so there is really a need to protect the consumer here. And I want to speak a little bit more to pricing when it comes to consumption. Last week, just before the rain, like everybody, I went for the excitement because I really didn't need anything but the crackers to the store. <laughs> and you know, you saw everybody purchasing and buying. And one of my coworkers who accompanied me she walked up to the milk and she said, oh my goodness. And I was like, what's happening? And she's like, oh, has this milk moved from $2.75 to $4.50 a can? And this is in a standard supermarket. So I'm not here to bash any supplier because we know inflation, import, export, you can't control it, but you can have some control over your, I don't know to explain it in the right terms, the scale at which you make your profit. There must, the, sorry, 
markup. Okay, good. There must be some control mechanisms put in place to protect the consumer. And in particular, to protect consumers, not just in urban settings, but in rural settings. There was a time when persons said, you know, um, milk should be more expensive in the country. And the question was, why? Because the supermarkets in the country, the shops, mom and pop shops and so forth, have to pay a little bit more because of the transportation cost for items moving from town to St. Paul's. Okay, but if you check, are the suppliers charging a, a transportation cost for the goods, a delivery cost? Oftentimes there is not a delivery cost, so there must not be a translated increase in cost of our milk in a shop in St. Paul's versus milk in a store in town. Nor should consumers in St. Kitts have to go to Value Mart to buy milk, Rams to buy butter, um, Kumars are not propping up anybody, but I'm going to call out of them Kumars to buy um, diaper, Best Buy to buy sugar, and just because you cannot guarantee the price across supermarkets. <coughs> Prices should be similar. However, businesses are free to do whatever markup they want, but it must not be exor exorbitant. Can be beyond what? Right, beyond the law. Right, That's because if you want to be a bougie supermarket and sell the milk for four seventy five when everybody's supposed to be selling it for four seventy five consumers must have choice, but consumers must be protected, and it's the legislation that does this. I must also mention moral ethics and ethical responsibility, which is something that some people think does not exist in a capitalist world, our consumer-governed world, but it does. Because the, the idea of consumer protection is really about morals. The businesses and companies that do not want to point their moral compass north are guided and regulated by this legislation. Trust comes from ethics. Trust building comes from consumers and suppliers knowing that they can trust each other, knowing that the purchase of the Quix crackers is Quix that was manufactured just a month ago and it's fresh, that it's stored in a safe place in the warehouse, that it's not extracted from the landfill, that when I use it, I can be comfortable knowing that it is Quix made with real flour. I recall a couple months, no, a couple of years ago, when there was this, for me, I don't even know if it was a crisis, but everyone was saying, oh, plastic rice. Y'all remember when there was this claim that the rice wasn't real and you were consuming it and it's making you sick? Now, how do we protect consumers from having to worry about plastic <laughs> rice if we don't have this right legislative amendment? It's clear. And further, we know that some countries, if there is a drought, if there is a problem, if there is, if there is a crop failure, as was experienced just recently in India, where they control the exports of basmati rice to the international market, the price is going to change. How do we protect consumers from unscrupulous, immoral, unethical suppliers who are going to go somewhere else in some part of the world to get some fake product and label it as basmati rice? We have to make and support this legislation. I want to also reference another experience that a friend of mine had with purchasing a bike for Christmas. And it's just a coincidence that Christmas is on its way. A great auntie, she wants to buy a bike for all her nieces and nephews. She goes to a store in town and she says to the supplier, I would like to purchase this bike. Number one infraction, miss I don't take card, right? I only take cash. You have to go around to the ATM, come back with the cash. By the time she gets back with the cash, the bike is still there. She was told 350 for the bike. 350 cash. The bike is still there with a second option that she did not want. And the supplier says to her, the bike is no longer available. 
you must have this one. She says, no, you just told me this bike, 350, go and get cash. But what happened? In the space of, the, in the time that it took for her to go around to the ATM and come back, the guy sold the bike to someone else for 550. And he was not interested in my friend's 350 anymore. Labels, put the amount, it, it, you must be able to walk in a store and see that this item cost $3.50 or $350 and not the price changes according to who steps into the store and how good you look. Are everybody going to have to go for Christmas and dress real raggedy to get good fair prices? So there's a need for us to protect the consumer. And the suppliers, again, as I want to echo the sentiments of the move of the bill, the suppliers must be educated as well because some persons are acting and not really aware that they're breaking the law and they're putting the consumer at harm. So there is a need for us to quickly support this, pass it, and move it along. And lastly, I want to mention inclusivity and social equity. Critical to becoming a sustainable island state, again, Madam Speaker, is that we have to protect the most vulnerable. We have to protect differently abled consumers. We have to ensure they're treated fairly and equitably. It doesn't matter if you can read just a little, you must be able to read the price. You must be confident that when you step into a store, no one is hustling you, no one is selling you expired goods, no one is selling you something because they don't have braille and you can't get a clear indication of what you are purchasing. You know, if we you don't make these legislative changes, not just for the regional legislative agenda, but for the quality of life in St. Kitts and Nevis, we are never going to attain a sustainable island state. Legislation supports the changes that we want to make for sustainability. And that's why I'm very happy to support this and having provided the context and the link between the SDGs, SDG 12, Responsible Consumption and Production. It is a global indicator. It is a global target and we must do what we must here in St. Kitts and Nevis in order to stay aligned with the global sustainability agenda. With that said, Madam Speaker, thank you. Thank you to the Honorable Senator, Dr. Clark. Is there another presenter? I recognize the Honorable Member for Nevis 10. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And let me say good morning to all and just want to rise to make an intervention to the bill that is before this honor the house. And uh, let me say from the onset that I took that stern warning from the mover of the bill very seriously, and I will not dare oppose it. I will not disappoint you. Because I'm a consumer. We are all consumers. And I think this bill is very timely. I have gone through it. I didn't get a chance to read the entire bill. It's a quite a comprehensive piece of legislation. But from some of what I would have gleaned from the bill, I think it is a bill that is trying its utmost to protect all of us as consumers. And anything that protects us as consumers, we should seek at all times to support. I said the bill is timely because, Madam Speaker, I think... Every day, we hear complaints from consumers. Every day, we hear complaints about consumers, from consumers when they go to the supermarket, when they go to the grocery store, when they go to the hardware store. And uh, there are complaints about everything. There are complaints about the price, there's complaints about the appearance, there's complaints about the taste, there's complaints about practically everything. And I know that there was a bill that was existing before, but I think it, it, was, it was timely that the bill be updated after so many years. 
Because many of the times when we hear consumers complaining, and we hear it every, I'm sure they hear, you hear it here in St. Kitts, I know in Nevis you hear it all the time, um, the consumer affairs people not doing anything. And the persons in the supermarkets are not doing what the consumer affairs officers are telling them. They go and they suggest something to the persons and nothing changes. But this bill now goes so much further in ensuring that the persons who are policing the bill, the persons who are part of the, the um, Consumer Affairs Department, they have some powers in which to act. I am happy as well that the, the bill makes reference to the um, establishment of a board, which of course could act as a, almost as a quasi-court as well because it actually gives more power to the persons who are the consume, in the consumer affairs department. It adds to their powers because what they cannot do, the board in, it, in its essence will do. I'm also happy that there's a lot of reference in the bill with regards to services. Because many of the times when we hear about consumer protection, most of us think about goods only. But the provision of service is also very, very important. I'm a little bit intrigued though because when we speak about services, we, we, we tend to think more about the services that people are providing, a tangible service. But when we look at the services that we get in many of the offices, the government offices, the supermarkets, the customer service in per se. I'm wondering if this bill goes that far. And if it doesn't, maybe sometime in the future it should go there. Because customer service, Madam Speaker, is very, very poor in St. Kitts and Nevis. And sometimes the customer service that you get, the bad customer service that you get, is even worse than the provision of the tangible service and the provision of the goods that that persons are getting. Now, Madam Speaker, I, as I said, I perused the bill quite a bit. And I was particularly very happy with the section that speaks to complaints. And uh, this bill gives the consumers the rights not only to make a complaint, but it gives the consumer an additional option in terms of taking it to the court. I note in the bill that it says that the con consumer can actually file a civil complaint or criminal complaint in the court. And so we know we live in an age now where everything is litigation and everybody wants to go to the court because the numerous lawyers that we have in St. Kitts and Nevis, they must get some kind of jobs. And so everybody wants to run to the court. And so I believe because this bill now gives the consumers the option of going to court, some persons may override going to the board and probably take the matter to the court themselves. Now, I was also happy when I realized that there is a lot of, um, in the bill, there is a lot of transparency. And of course, the loopholes are plugged in terms of the complaints. I realized that when a complaint is made, it's made to the department and then a copy goes to the person who made the complaint. And so there's a paper trail, which is very important. And then of course, that complaint, that certified complaint also goes to the board. And so the person who makes the complaint gets a certified copy. The board gets a certified copy. And well, it's not listed in the bill, but I'm assuming that the department itself would keep a certified copy of the complaint. And I realize in one of the schedules, you actually have what the complaint should be like. And so I must give credit to the, to the framers of this legislation in being so comprehensive in ensuring that there is that paper trail. And so after the complaint would have been made, and when the investigation is to be done, as 
as said by the mover of the bill, that you actually have what is being complained about on paper. And so the person who is making the complaint and the, the supplier that the complaint is being made against, they are aware of when this was done, what the exact complaint was, and what the redress should be. I, the mover also spoke about the labeling, and that is, a, that, is, that is something that is very, should be very dear to all of us. Because a lot of the times persons go to the supermarket and products are not properly labeled. And apart from the fact that the labeling should be in English, which all of us speak, and I, that is the only language I can speak, I have to say, the, the, apart from the fact that the labeling should be in English, which you can read, it should also be very legible. Because many of the times you pick up an item and the labeling is so small that you need to put it under a microscope in order to read it. And maybe there is a reason why the labeling is so small. Because they do not want you to read what is on the label. And so it is important that when labeling is done, that it is not only in English that we can read it, but you can see it and you can read it properly. You shouldn't have to go in to, to get a magnifying glass in order to read the label, because this is something that could affect your health and your well-being. And so it is important that you can read and read it properly. I know the mover of the bill, and, and, and the, when I looked first glance at the bill, I, I, I was very happy because the bill at the onset says that it is for the promotion and protection of consumer interest in relation to the supply of goods and the provision of services to ensure protection of life, health, and safety. And I like the part about health and safety as well. Now, I was a little intrigued when the, when the mover said that if he, somebody purchases a product and the product makes you sick, you can get redress. But we have to be very careful where that is concerned because unless you can have the proof that that particular product made you sick, because I'm sure you would have consumed other items as well before getting sick. So there's a thin line as to how you can prove whether or not it was that particular product that you consumed that caused the illness. And so I can see a little issues there. If you take this matter to court, the, the um, supplier could say, well, this is not the product that probably made you sick. Because of course, we realize that in this bill is outlined all of the rights of the consumers. But remember, the suppliers also have rights as well. Everybody have rights. And so we have to be very careful in terms of how we try to determine whether or not a particular item or a particular product that we bought, that would have um, created a sickness. There might be a case where, and as and persons, you know, when, we, when you're buying something, people, they give you all kind of flowery language in order for you to encourage you to buy the product. You know, and they may tell you that a product is supposed to do X and Y. And you may get the product, and in your estimation that product did not do X and Y. It may have done X, but it did, didn't do Y. And then you now as a consumer have to prove whether or not the product did not do what it was supposed to do. And all other the time, sometimes persons are selling products and they tell you, well, this product is supposed to work well for you when you're having your nocturnal activities. It may not work, but then can you prove whether or not it didn't work? Maybe something is wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in essence though I, I have to say Madam President that this bill Madam Speaker I, am, I apologize I have to say that this bill 
in essence, it's very, very comprehensive. And apart from the fact that the bill will protect all of us as consumers, the bill is putting our suppliers on notice that they need to step up. Because really and truly, a lot of the times, the goods and the services that are being provided are subpar, below standard. And it is telling our consumers, listen, you, I'm sorry, your suppliers, listen, you have to step up because the provision of your goods and services will now be under the microscope. And I hope that our consumers will take advantage of all the rights and all the privileges that they have from the provisions of this bill. I'm happy when the mover said that there will be some educational sessions because I was going to suggest that as well. Because a lot of the times consumers don't know what their rights are. There are numerous rights that are listed here in the, in the bill. And persons need to be reminded, those who don't know, people need to learn what their rights are. And so I am assuming and that you will have broad-based educational sessions where people know what their rights are. They know what the infringements of, the, of, of, of your, their rights are and how to move forward. I have to say, though, that Madam Speaker, in the constitution of the board, because this board, the consumer board, is as an extremely important board. And I am hoping that when the board is being constituted, that you are very particular in the persons who are charged with the responsibility of being a part of this board. Because many of the times, and all of us as politicians are guilty of this, sometimes we just place somebody on a board because we want them to make a little bit more money. But this is very important. We're dealing with people's health and safety here. We're dealing with consumers' rights. And so we must be very particular in terms of the persons who are placed on this board, that they are competent individuals who can properly police the legislation. We heard that the, the board can be a quasi-court. And so the persons who can act in such capacity should be competent of what their responsibilities are, and they can act properly to ensure that the rights of the consumers are respected. And so, Madam Speaker, I think that the bill is a very good piece of legislation. I would not oppose it because, as I said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a consumer. And all of us on the opposition side, on the opposition bench, are consumers. And so, since this bill is trying its utmost to protect all of us as consumers, I will support the bill. And as I said, I want to support the persons who put the bill together. It's very, very comprehensive. I think it dealt with practically everything with regards to consumer rights. And uh, I want to just wish this bill safe passage to this honorable house. And I'm hopeful, Madam Speaker, that once the bill is passed, once the board is constituted, that the board will do its work, the department will do its work, and so the consumers, the consumers will ensure that their rights are protected at all times for all of us and for our safety and for our health. And so with these few words, Madam Speaker, I would like to support the bill and to wish it safe passage through this honorable house. May it please you. Thank you to the honorable member for Nevis 10. Is there another presenter? I recognize the honorable member for Nevis 11.
Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise to make my contribution to this bill currently before this Honorable House. And I, I rise because I feel that this bill must get the support of this side of the House, of course. And as my colleague would have intimated just now, <laughs> And it reminded us that the move of the bill said there's absolutely no way that we can oppose this bill. And he might be right about that, but I also want to look at a few things that I, I, I think should be mentioned here today. Uh, I've said in the past, and I continue to say that this honorable house is about ensuring that we're doing the business of the people. And doing the business of the people means that when the government brings something that is worthy of support, all members, whether on the government side or the opposition side, must and should support. This one, of course, is one of, of those uh, such bills where the interests of the people of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis must be served here today in, in ensuring that the protection that they should have as consumers is addressed through this legislation moving forward. But Madam Speaker, I live within the boundaries of realism and pragmatism, and there are certain things that one have to question, and question them to get the best out of any legislation that comes. And I believe my colleague would have touched on the composition of the board, of uh, the board that is going to oversee this particular bit of legislation. And let me say that uh, consumer protection is being addressed through this legislation, but also those who are charged with uh, given that mandate to oversee this legislation and to enforce, they also are a part of the protection process, meaning unscrupulous boards can do things that can harm consumers in the end as well too. And that is why it is important, as was raised before, that the composition of the board, which is articulated in the, uh, in the, the legislation, the composition is there, where the general public would need to know. Let me just read them out so that the, the general public that is following is aware of what the composition of the board uh, is to be or should be like. It says here under part two, Consumer Protection Board. Uh, the board, of course, will be established, must be under this legislation. And the constitution of the board, as it says here, part, well, part two, section six and subsection two, the board shall consist of a member who has knowledge and experience in the industry or in industry, B, I should have said A, and then B, a member who has knowledge and experience in commerce. C, a member who is an attorney at law of at least seven years standing, who shall be the chairperson of the board. D, a member who has knowledge and experience in public administration. And E, a member who has knowledge and experience in consumer prote protection. Now it goes on in section three, or subsection three. The minister may appoint one of the members of the board to the chairperson, to be chairperson, and another member to be the deputy chairperson of the board. Now this three, subsection three, the minister may appoint one of the members of the board. They seem to be some conflict in the sense that C, the composition of the board says a member who is an attorney at law of at least seven years standing who shall be the chairperson of the board. And now it is saying in subsection three that the minister may, may appoint. I'm not a lawyer, but I've always heard of shall and may and interchange and interpose or whatever the case might be. So some clarity is needed there because I am understanding that a lawyer who has seven years shall be appointed to be the chairman of the board. And then it says the minister may. So it seems as though there is some discretion 
on the part of the minister uh, to uh, appoint a chairperson, which it is very clear that the chairperson shall, and I, I could use the word, must be the chairperson of this particular board. That is just something to look at, uh, perhaps, as we go along to make sure we are getting that right. But, Madam Speaker, there's something about the board that I am going to stick with that because I am concerned that board members, they must know and they must understand the authority that they would have under this legislation. And as, as such, they will be held to a certain standard, a very high standard as well, because we understand the legislation is meant to protect our people's health, their safety, and the likes. Now, this board is not a board similar to NHC board, for example. It cannot be categorized that way. It cannot be looked at as a board for Skellig, Nevlek, or any other institution or arm of government. This is a powerful board, and I say that clearly here today. It is a powerful board. We are trying also to ensure that we are consistent with other CARICOM territories that we, are, uh, where we have that relationship with. And as such, this repeal that is being done today and this passage of this bill, which will come, is indeed a quantum leap forward, in my opinion, in terms of the health and safety of our people. And that is why I, I am focusing on this board to ensure as my colleague would have said before me, that we are not just, you know, for political expediency or whatever the case might be, or to give somebody a, a board fee, just selecting persons to put on a board such as this, uh, because we want to ensure that the board is doing what it must do. As a matter of fact, I don't know if it is being done here on St. Kitts, but I was in charge of a board at one point, and all of us had to go to the court, the high court, to take an oath, an oath of secrecy. And why I say oath of secrecy is because persons, we live in a small society, and I do not think that the purpose of this legislation is to create harm in terms of destroying any business here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. I think the aim of this legislation is to ensure that all sides and all parties are being protected, meaning consumers, businesses, and also those who are sitting on those boards, they must be protected as well too. And they must understand, they must protect businesses to the extent that we hear about flies and dogs and blah, blah, blah. Let's leave it as that. I would hope that that is not the case in St. Kitts Nevis where dogs and cats and so forth are roaming among our food. But if that is the case, that is terrible. But the point I'm trying to make is that if, for example, the board is charged. I am looking at the, it's part two, uh, constitutional board, which is six, section six, and subsection C. Yeah? So I'm, I'm talking about the preservation and integrity of food items and so forth. Now, all businesses, uh, everyone who goes into business, goes into business to serve customers to make money. And in so doing, they, they are also held to a certain uh, standard by consumers. Now, for example, let's look at it by way of example. And let's be practical. Small community. St. Kitts and Nevis, relatively speaking, is very small. There's an investigation being conducted on business A. Before it reaches anywhere, the information is on the street and all kinds of things are being said about that particular business. Because of the lack of confidentiality and that word that was used before, trust, that you should have coming from the, the, the board that is overseeing these things. So when that happens, how do you treat a situation like that? How do you treat board members who are not confidential, not trustworthy, and are leaking information out to the general public so as to cause harm to business A or any other business? There must be some checks and balance there. There must be something. And I don't think I see it in the legislation where there's any... 
I don't think that I think I see any uh, penalties for persons or members of the board who deliberately, and I will use the word deliberately because some will do it deliberately, go out there and create difficulties for the business community. And so that might be something that we may have to look at, perhaps, to ensure that there are penalties for board of, it says here though, that they can resign, Res resignation it can be done at any time, but I think, I think that if you're going to hold businesses to a certain standard and perhaps charge businesses for anything that is considered unscrupulous, then at least board members should also be held to the same standard. And that is how you'll have some equity in the whole thing in terms of ensuring that everyone who is involved in the process is doing what they should do to protect the consumer. So that is something that I just wanted to put on the table um, to be addressed, if it can be addressed, whether today or at some point or the other, but it must be looked at that way. Madam Speaker, I also believe that if the board is doing their work, there must be regular reporting, whether monthly, annually, of numbers, meaning how many businesses, I don't want to get the name of the businesses, I don't think that is necessary. But how are we tracking the uh, work of the board in terms of whether they're doing their work or not? If they're investigating, how many investigative or in investigations were done? And what were the nature of those uh, investigations? The general public would need to know that in terms of knowing what is being done by the board and whether our best interest is being looked after. So monthly or annual reporting, I believe, should be a part of the entire process so that persons could know what is happening in that regard. Now, Madam Speaker, it is not in this particular bill, but we're moving quickly in the realms of technology. Every minute there is some change in technology. I don't know if there's somewhere that could have been in this. I, we speak about goods and services, but a specific section about technology, right? Because here's why I bring it up. Cell phones, smart TVs, that kind of thing, especially cell phones. They end up in the hands of some of these persons who are repairing cell phones, for example. And I suppose the argument will be that there are laws on the books and the police may become involved, but I still think that, maybe I'm, I'm wrong about this, but I still think that there might be some need, some need to address uh, that particular uh, bit of information in this bill in terms of how do you treat um, dealing with matters pertaining to technology in this particular legislation. And not so much someone having a difficulty and run to the police, but they I, I, may, I may have to frame my thoughts in that regard, but I just think that the way we are heading as, as a, a country and as a global community, technology seems to be uh, the, the major thing these days. You hear about AI, you hear about uh, you know, new smartphones moving from one um, level to the next. You know? So I just think that technology should have formed part of this in some way. And that is just a suggestion. And it is uh, just a thought that came to my mind, really. But anyway, Madam Speaker, I do believe that this bill, in terms of it replacing the original um, legislation that was there, which was, which is called what? It's here now, it's 182 says it's Consumer Affairs Act, will be repealed by this particular bit uh, of legislation or this bill, which is fine with me. And I, uh, as was meant and mentioned by my colleague, all of us are consumers and all of us would like to see the best being done and who better to uh, handle such affairs than the Parliament of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis to make sure that we are seeking to protect our consumer, seeking to protect our businesses, seeking to protect all of us to ensure that we have uh, a harmonious society moving forward. Madam Speaker, I didn't intend to labor too long on this one, but I just wanted to uh, at least let my voice be heard and make those few points on, on this bill. Uh, and, and I close by saying that 
I believe that we are on the right track in terms of a parliament, in terms of what we are doing, to address the practical things that need to be addressed uh, here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. And I wish this bill safe passage. And indeed, uh, any adjustments that are necessary, let it be done. But by and large, the bill have my support. May it please you. Thank you to the Honorable Member for Nevis 11. Is there another presenter? I recognize the Honorable num Member for number six to do his wrap up. Right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Let me again emphasize how important this piece of legislation has been. And there's no doubt that from the full extent of the debate in this House, it really has met my own expectations that it was going to be so significant that both sides of the House would become engaged. And so I want to thank not only my colleague on this side of the House, the distinguished senator and minister for environment and um, sustainable development, etc., but also my colleagues on the opposite side who have given their full support to this piece of legislation. But in the process, of course, have made some important um, suggestions and would have pointed out certain specific areas that we need to look at as we perfect this legislation and, makes, and make it workable. Mr. Speaker, I think, as was mentioned, trust is critical. And I want to emphasize and endorse that. There has to be a trust between the consumer and the provider of the services or goods that are being, um, that are being um, transacted. It is going to be very important that we always recognize safety. I go back to trust because if there's no trust, then the safety requirements can be in some way affected. I don't believe that there is any doubt that the education that I spoke of would be shortchanged. Education of the consumer, education of the provider of the service or, for, or of the commodity, that is going to be critically important in going forward. And so each of us, even as legislators, would have to be up to date with the expectations because we have, we have um, we, we have constituents who, from time to time, will come to us and seek guidance on a number of matters of this kind. And so we should be very much, we should be familiar with the outline and the objectives of this piece of legislation in terms of protecting consumers. Because a lot of us, of course, will have constituents who are consumers, all of us. And as a result of that, we must be um, we must be familiar with the legislation ourselves. Um, it's very interesting that um, the, the, the member for Nevis 12 did... Nevis 11. 12 has not come as yet. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> Nevis 11 who was very correct in looking at the, um, the, consumption, the composition of the Consumer Protection Board and who identified in Section 6.2 that there is an anomaly um, in 6.2c and also 6.2.3, right. Because really, it says here in Section 6.2, 
section 6, subsection 2, that, and referring to C, a member who is an attorney of, at law of at, of at least seven years standing, and it says, who shall be the chairperson of the board? But later on, in 3, it says, that is subsection 3, it says, the minister may appoint one of the members of the board to be the chairperson and another member to be the deputy chairperson, etc. Really, we will, have, we will have to have an amendment because it is not expected that the chairperson has to be um, a lawyer. And so we would have to make that amendment later. Thank um, my colleague on the other side for pointing out what uh, appears to be an, an error that we would have to correct, because that is not the intention, really. I believe that, really, we, we've, 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 we've done what is expected of us as parliamentarians. We have constantly heard the cries of our people. We recognize that something needs to be done, and we have come here. And we have made a serious attempt to address a lot of these concerns which would have come our way over a period of time. The Consumer Protection Bill, again, it sets out a particular framework that consolidates in one place key consumer protection rights that are exercisable in relation to the supply of goods and services. The bill also has established the duties and the obligations of suppliers. Further, the bill establishes administrative and legal frameworks for the identification of violations involving the supply of goods and services. The physical and financial security of consumers on fair trade practices and transactions and on fair contract terms. And wherever we are emphasizing, wherever there are violations, the bill also has given us provision for both consumers and suppliers to be heard and that is what I, the point I want to make, is the balance that this piece of legislation brings. It gives the opportunity, wherever there are violations, it brings the opportunity for consumers and suppliers to be heard, and for consumer redress, and for supplier defense, wherever that is appropriate. And that is why I say it is a landmark piece of legislation, because it is fair and it is balanced. I want to say before wrapping up the debate, the second reading, that St. Kitts and Nevis really is in a new era, okay? And we are setting the stage for fairness, for balance, for justice, for all of these to be meted out and exercised and received by our people. There are new demands that are being made in this new era that we are entering. New demands such as being eco-friendly in businesses, being conscious of the emerging new technologies that are available to us and which have been mentioned specifically by my colleague from Nevis 11. We are speaking of embracing the digital economy. We will not get further as a developing nation unless we are prepared to embrace the digital economy. And unless we are going to be engaged and involved seriously into research and development. We speak of being an innovative people. 
in a new and emerging innovative country. We have quality production systems and the products from these systems and the branding and the high quality and the technically skilled force that we are encouraging to emerge. All this won't happen unless there are fair trade practices between the consumer and those who are supplying the service or the commodities. So we are really setting the stage for moving in the right direction. And one of the important critical areas that we continue to complain about, as I said before, as a people, was this whole thing about price, price gouging and so forth. I want to make it clear that the government has set the basic formula that should be applied when it comes to this particular matter. In fact, I want to share with you, I want to share with you the publication, the publication that we have at the moment with regard to the distribution and price of goods. I mentioned earlier that how are the prices set? The prices are set based on the import cost. And that, of course, entails what you buy it for and the cost for transportation, etc. And the marker which would have been set by the government through the Distribution and Price of Goods Act, which we practice in this country and which brings guidelines to the members of the Consumer Protection Officers in the Ministry of Consumer Affairs, etc. I want to give you an example of what I speak of. For example, based on this Distribution and Price of Goods Act, I want to just touch a number of common commodities and say to you that there is a specific percentage and thus the price would emerge based on these percentage guidelines. Let us take, for example, frozen chicken. The maximum wholesale price, according to the law that we are using at this time, should have a 20% only 20% only on the landed cost of the chicken, frozen chicken. The consumer affairs officer, when he visits the supermarket, he would have been armed with information from customs, or even if he doesn't go to the store, with the information in terms of the import cost from customs, he should be able to go and knock on the office door of that particular supermarket or business place and say, show, show me what are your costs at landing, what you have paid, etc." And then he would make his calculation. 20% all the market should have. So if it is more than that, then we know that's price gouging. And that is going to be attacked by the consumer. That is wrong. And that is how it is done. And that is how we intend to ensure that it continues to be done. In the past, when that was done, the guy could say, well, um, it costs one, so he may say, show me. 
And he may say, well, I can't find the documents now. Go, you know, go away or something. Can't do that anymore. The law says he must show the documents what it cost when the goods were brought into the country from overseas, looking at, as I said, his buying price from the company, the freight, the insurance, and 20% only is the maximum that should be charged. Of course, he can go below, because if the guy down the street is selling at 20 that he would have applied, he may say, boy, I could live with 15% markup, so I drop my price down. It should never be above. And I make mention that all these goods, they're here. Chicken frozen, meat, and they're not only given the price. They're not only given the price in Bastia, because I think the senator minister made mention of the price changes accordingly based on where you are, rural parts or town. But the list outlines the maximum retail price in special districts and the maximum retail price in Bastia. So the wholesale price for the chicken I just mentioned was 20% on London cost. But in the Bastia area, the maximum retail price could go to 25%. But in the country or special areas, it's still 25%. You have to be smart now in shopping or smarter in shopping. You have to ask questions. And the Consumer Affairs Department, it must do its work. It must continue to publish on a regular basis the movement of prices based on the landing cost and the maximum markup that is allowed. This is to protect our consumers. That is the new era that we are entering in. That is how we are going to create a sustainable island state. That is how we are going to make sure that the, the, the necessary um, sustainable development goals are achieved. All of us have to work with each other for this to be achieved. With those few words, Madam Speaker, and with the support of my colleagues, I want to thank you all for this opportunity to ensure that St. Kitts and Nevis moves into the new era and we protect our consumers in the process and we encourage our businessmen bring in the best of what there is for us to consume. Nice up your stores. Make sure that they are hygienically fit. No cockroaches and rats running a place. Nice it up, smooth up the place. Change the tires, put on your pants. This is a new St. Kitts and Nevis that we are creating. May it please you, balance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the honorable member. Thank you to the honorable member, the mover of the bill. The question, therefore, is that the bill, is shortly entitled Consumer Protection Bill 2023, be read a second time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. A bill to provide for the promotion and protection of consumer interests in relation to the supply of goods and the provision of services to ensure the protection of life, health, and safety of consumers, the establishment of a consumer affairs department, and for connected purposes, otherwise known as the Consumer Protection Bill 2023. The bill shortly entitled Consumer Protection Bill 2023 has been read a second time. House moves to committee stage.
clauses one through five. The question is that clauses one through five stand part of the bill. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Clause six. Yes, clause six would need to be amended to delete the words who shall be chairman, who shall be the chairperson of the board in section, subsection 2C. So subsection 2C should read, a member who is an attorney at law of at least seven years standing only. So that is what it should read, and it should remove from who shall to the board. No, not the word only, sorry. <laughs> so you should read, mm -hmm. a member who is an attorney at law of at least seven years standing. <laughs> yes, yeah, semicolon. The question is that section 262C, as amended, stands part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Clauses 7 through 182. The question is that clauses 7 through 182 stand part of the bill. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Schedule 1. The question is that Schedule 1 stands part of the bill. Those in favor? <laughs> Those against? The ayes have it. Schedules 2 through 5. The question is that Schedules 2 through 5 stand part of the bill. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The arrangement of sections? The question is that the arrangement of sections stand part of the bill. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The enacting clause. The question is that the enacting clause stands part of the bill. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The title. The question is that the title stands part of the bill. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Post resumes. I recognize the Honorable Member for St. Christopher Six. Madam Speaker, I rise again with your leave to report that the bill shortly entitled the Consumer Protection Bill 2023, that it has gone through the committee stage. There has only been one amendment. I therefore ask that this bill be allowed to have its third reading and thus become one of the laws of St. Christopher Davis. I rise to second motion, Madam Speaker. Very well. The question is that the bill shortly entitled Consumer Protection Bill 2023 be read a third time and passed into law. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. A bill to provide for the promotion and protection of consumer interests in relation to the supply of goods and provisions of services to ensure the protection of life, health, and safety of consumers, the establishment of a consumer affairs department, and for connected purposes, otherwise known as the Consumer Protection Bill 2023. The bill shortly entitled Consumer Protection Bill 2023 has been read a third time and passed into law. Honorable members, is this a convenient time for some nourishment? I usually don't have luck with that line, you know.
Oh, very well, we'll proceed. I recognize the Honorable Attorney General. Madam Speaker, I rise to lead the debate of and have read for a second time in this August Assembly today the bill shortly titled the Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2023. Madam Speaker, this short but important bill concerns a single issue, the amendment of the definition of tainted property within our Proceeds of Crime legislation. With your leave, Madam Speaker, I first intend to describe what the Proceeds of Crime Act is used for. Then I will explain why we prioritize the confiscation of proceeds of crime. I will also rationalize what the amendment actually achieves, whilst emphasizing the critical significance of the amendment in strengthening the ability of law enforcement to recover proceeds of crime. And lastly, I will aim to provide our people with a comprehensive understanding of why we must take this step and how it aligns with our overarching commitment or the overarching commitment of this administration to combat crime in our federation and preserve the integrity of our justice system. These are fundamental elements in achieving a sustainable island state. Madam Speaker, what is the Proceeds of Crime Act? The act was enacted in November 2000 23 years ago, and has undergone 12 amendments over the past years, reflecting this National Assembly's commitment to adapt to evolving challenges in combating crime. The last amendment was passed in March 2021. The Act serves several critical purposes. It provides a legal framework for the freezing, forfeiture, and confiscation of the proceeds of crime. This is a crucial tool for law enforcement to deprive criminals of the financial benefits they get, they gain through illegal activities. The Act also creates offenses and procedures to prevent money laundering, a process that criminals often use to legitimize the proceeds of their crimes. It enables the enforcement of overseas freezing, forfeiture, and confiscation orders, emphasizing the international dimension of crime and the need for cross-border cooperation. The foundation of this Act, therefore, is our ability to identify, pursue, prosecute, and recover the proceeds of crime at all levels. This encompasses the ability to proceed against tainted property. As an aside, Madam Speaker, it's important to note that the Proceeds of Crime and Asset Recovery Act 2020 was passed in this National Assembly in January 2020 and published in June 2020. However, it was never brought into force. I am informed because there are some administrative issues that need to be resolved prior to, prior to the implementation. Our team at the Attorney General's office is reviewing that act and will only move to bring it into operation when we are satisfied that it can fulsomely be implemented. Madam Speaker, why should we prioritize the confiscation of proceeds of crime? Recovering the proceeds of crime serves as a powerful deterrent to criminals for several compelling reasons. First and foremost, it hits criminals where it hurts the most, their financial gain, or as we say colloquially, their pockets. I wish to highlight key, five key reasons why this is such an effective deterrent. One, criminals engage in illegal activities to profit from their actions. When law enforcement successfully recovers the ill-gotten gains, it not only deprives them of the rewards of their crimes, but also imposes a financial burden in terms of legal fees, fines, and restitution. This financial setback discourages potential criminals who weigh the risks and rewards. Two, criminals understand that their criminal proceeds could be seized, making them hesitant to enjoy their illicit gains. This fear of losing their assets or wealth becomes a significant disincentive to engage in criminal activities in the first place. Three, many criminals use their proceeds to fund extravagant lifestyles or invest in legal activities. The threat of losing these assets can lead to a significant decline in their quality of life. This loss of comfort and status acts as a deterrent. Four, successful recovery of the proceeds of crime sets an example and sends a clear message to potential criminals that illegal activities will not go unpunished. 
the fear of facing similar consequences acts as a deterrent across society. And five, asset recovery limits the resources available for criminal enterprises, making it harder for criminal organizations to operate and expand. This financial squeeze can weaken their ability to commit crimes. Madam Speaker, what does this simple amendment do? The proposed amendment to the Procedure of Crime Act expands the definition of tainted property within the existing legislation. The March 2021 amendment narrowed the interpretation of tainted property, which then significantly restricted the investigative powers of the police and the ability to apply the widest range of forfeiture and asset recovery. The proposed amendment, the definition is sufficiently clear and comprehensive. It says, and I quote, Madam Speaker, tainted property in relation to the commission of an offense includes property used in or in connection with the commission of an offense, that is a crime, derived, obtained, or realized directly or indirectly from the commission of a crime, has been used in or in connection with unlawful conduct, or is intended to be used in or in connection with unlawful conduct. Madam Speaker, as you are well aware from your prosecutorial practice, unlawful conduct means conduct which if it occurs in St. Christopher and Nevis, is unlawful under the criminal law of St. Kitts and Nevis. Or if it occurs in a country outside St. Kitts and Nevis, is unlawful under the criminal law of that country. And if it had occurred in St. Kitts and Nevis, would be unlawful under the criminal law of St. Kitts and Nevis. After consultations with the White Collar Crime Unit of the Royal St. Christopher and Nevis Police Force, the Anti-Money Laundering National Committee, NAMLAC, and the Asset Recovery Unit of the Regional Security Services, RSS, we recognize that this amended definition has limitations and it needed to be addressed. Therefore, the amendment we are proposing today corrects the 2021 limitation and expands the definition of tainted property to allow law enforcement to power the power to move against the widest range of proceeds of crimes related assets. By making this change, we strengthen our ability to combat crime, deter illegal activities, and ensure the recovery of ill-gotten gains. The changing nature of criminal activities necessitates adjustments. Criminals are becoming more sophisticated in their methods, utilizing a wide range of assets to facilitate their illegal activities. The existing definition, however, is not sufficiently broad to encompass the full spectrum of proceeds of crime. Without this amendment, there's a genuine risk that law enforcement agencies, and in particular, the White Collar Crime Unit, may face significant obstacles in their endeavors to recover the proceeds of crime. The nature of white collar crime often involves the use of property or assets that are not directly linked to the offense, but play a crucial role in facilitating it. This amendment is critical to the work of investigators and prosecutors who thrive, who strive to hold perpetrators of white collar crime accountable. Madam Speaker, why have a clear and comprehensive definition of tainted property? The importance of having a strong definition within this legislative framework cannot be overstated, and it encompasses several key dimensions. A precise definition provides legal clarity and certainty, ensuring that law enforcement agencies, prosecutors, and the judiciary have effective, can effectively apply the law. Without a clear definition, there may be ambiguity and confusion in determining which assets can be seized or forfeited, potentially leading to legal disputes and delays in this criminal justice process. The primary goal of proceeds of crime legislation is to deter criminal activity by depriving criminals of the financial benefits derived from their unlawful activities. A robust definition of tainted property enables authorities to identify and seize assets obtain, obtained through criminal activities making it more difficult for criminals to enjoy the proceeds of their crimes. This in turn serves as a deterrent in engaging in illegal activities. A clear def definition of tainted property is essential to protect the rights of individuals and businesses. Without a strong definition, there's a risk that legitimate assets could be mistakenly seized, potentially infringing on the property rights and due process rights of innocent parties. A clear definition helps to ensure that only assets generally linked to criminal activities are subject to forfeiture. Many countries have proceeds of crime legislation, and international cooperation is often necessary to combat transnational organized crime. 
having a consistent and well-defined concept of tainted property facilitates cooperation and the sharing of information and assets across borders. It allows for a more effective global response to criminal organizations engaging in money laundering, corruption, and other illegal activities. Clear definitions enable law enforcement agencies to focus their resources on assets that are most likely to be linked to criminal activities. This efficiency can lead to a more effective allocation of resources and a greater chance of successfully seizing and forfeiting ill-gotten gains. When the public perceives that the legal system is effectively addressing the issue of criminal proceeds, it can lead to increased trust in the justice system. A strong definition of tainted property, along with effective enforcement of proceeds of crime legislation, helps maintain public confidence and demonstrates the government's commitment to combating crime. And Madam Speaker, lastly, how do steps like this take us towards a sustainable island state? The proposed amendment of the definition of tainted property within our proceeds of crime legislation is not a mere technicality. It is a fundamental step in our ongoing efforts to combat crime, protect the rights of individuals and businesses, and preserve the integrity of our justice system. By enhancing the precision, clarity, and international compatibility of this definition, we can further our mission to deter criminal activity, ensure the fair application of the law, and bolster the efficiency and effectiveness of our law, of our law enforcement agencies, critical elements of a sustainable island state. The effective recovery of proceeds of crime reinforces the rule of law, instilling confidence in the justice system. This, in turn, dissuades individuals from resorting to illegal activities. Recovering the proceeds of crime acts as a formidable deterrent to criminals by targeting their financial interests, instilling fear of loss, and demonstrating the legal consequences of criminal behavior. This multifaceted approach not only punishes wrongdoers, but also discourages others from engaging in lawful activities, contributing to a safer and more just society. Let us remember that our society is built upon the principles of justice and the rule of law. We need not go further than the first paragraph within our constitution, which states that the people of St. Christopher and Nevis desire the creation of a climate of economic well-being in the context of respect for law and order. Modern legislation, like the Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2023, strengthens those foundations, making it clear that all crime does not pay and that the rights of the innocent will always be protected. In doing so, we stand united in our commitment to a safer and more just society for all as we charter the course of our nation towards a sustainable island state with robust institutions that can outlast and subvert any future attempts to destroy our country through rampant corruption based on greed, all in the goal of getting filthy rich to public office. Those days are over, Madam Speaker. Together, on the constitutional commitment to achieve our national objectives with a unity of purpose, we can further strengthen our ability to combat crime and recover the proceeds of criminal activities, ensuring a safer and more just future for our nation. Madam Speaker, with those few words, I wish the Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2023 safe passage. May it please you. Thank you to the Honorable Attorney General. The mover of the bill. Is there another presenter? I recognize the Honorable Senator Philip. Madam Speaker, I rise to simply second the motion of the bill and reserve my right to speak at this time. Thank you. Very well. Is there another presenter? Madam Speaker, given that there are no other presenters, um, I've said all that I need to say with respect to this very simple but very important bill before this Honorable House, and I wish it safe passage. Question is that the bill shortly entitled Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2023 be read a second time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. A bill to amend the Proceeds of Crimes Act, Cap 4.28, and for related matters, otherwise known as the Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2023. The bill shortly entitled Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2023 has been read a second time. House moves to committee stage.
Clauses 1 and 2. The question is that clauses 1 and 2 stand part of the bill. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The enacting clause? Question is that the enacting clause stands part of the bill. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The title? The question is that the title stands part of the bill. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. House resumes. I recognize, <laughs> I recognize the Honorable Attorney General. Yes. Madam Speaker, I now move that the bill shortly titled Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2023 be read for a third time and passed. Second. Madam Speaker, I beg to second that motion. The question is that the bill shortly entitled Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2023 be read a third time and passed into law. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. A bill to amend the Proceeds of Crime Act Cap 4.28 and for related matters, otherwise known as the Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2023. The bill shortly entitled Proceeds of Crime Amendment Bill 2023 has been read a third time and passed into law. Next item on the agenda, people. Motions. Resolutions. Hold on. Adjournment. Madam okay. Speaker, um, given that today is a year and five days by my calculations since this session of the House has been opened, I just wanted to briefly let the people know that we've, doing, we've been doing their business. Today, we have been able to debate and pass 25 laws in this honorable house. And overall, we have presented and tabled 32 bills, 25 of which have been passed into law. I just want to take this opportunity to thank the team at the Attorney General's office, particularly Karen and Allison, who meet with me regularly and we have a robust legislative agenda, and we promise the people that we'll continue to do their work in this Honorable House. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Attorney General. With your leave, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honorable Member for St. Christopher A. Thank you. Um, I would just want to take the opportunity quickly, Madam Speaker, to highlight what was mentioned by our Attorney General in terms of the number of bills that have been passed in this honorable house during the last year. I want to say that this has been a part of a government that is working and working tremendously hard on behalf of the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. We have passed a number of critical pieces of legislation that are transformative in the lives of our people here in St. Kitts and Nevis. One of those, of course, Madam Speaker, we can remember the one to do with domestic violence, where we made it possible for those who suffered domestic violence do not have to go to the high court anymore. A magistrate court can be called on in order to provide protection from domestic violence. And as a result, I'm almost certain that a number of our citizens would have been saved. Because we remember last year, between August or maybe September, there were a number of um, domestic issues that resulted in death. And therefore, it was necessary to do that. 
as part of creating our sustainable island state and seeking to make sure that the most vulnerable are protected. That is critical as we continue to build our democracy and our sustainable island state. Madam Speaker, our bill to deal with the Rastafarians and giving them the opportunity to practice their faith as they see fit, of course, based on their principles. That was also landmark. And so we can discuss many others, but if you were to ask me, those two are very close to me. And so I want to really thank this team that has been working tremendously hard, thank the AG and his office for the tremendous work that they have been doing thus far. Madam Speaker, I want to say um, as a, at this point to those who are suffering from breast cancer, let us remember them. Let us give them our support. I went to church on Sunday, the St. Peter's Anglican Church, and there was a nurse. She has spoken publicly. Her name is Miss Leticia Philip Caesar. And she gave the presentation. She's a nurse, a registered nurse at JNF. And she spoke about breast cancer very eloquently, giving the pertinent information and, of course, advising all those who were listening. But she also gave a personal story of dealing with the scourge of breast cancer, what she would have gone through from self-detection to the point where she rang a bell in Colombia completing her course of treatment and being told that she was cancer-free. She gives hope, Madam Speaker, hope that this disease can be dealt with, that the battle can be won, and therefore I want to say to all of our people here in St. Kitts and Nevis that let us support those who need our support so that they can have an easier transition in dealing with such a disease um, and that can aid in their recovery as well. And so I want to highlight Breast Cancer Month and to say that it is critical that we do such. Madam Speaker, I want to say that yesterday I attended a very important activity at the Kaon High School. They call it Kaon High School Best, where this organization, of course, is made up of alumni from the Kaon High School and also teachers and so forth. And so I was there with the day Marcella Leibert, our Governor General, who was once a teacher of the Kaon High School. And they recognized past principals, teachers, and those who were um, renowned athletes uh, at the Kayon High School. And so I want to say to those who were involved that these are the type of things that we need in our community. Where we see a school not just as being the responsibility of a government, but a school being the responsibility of a community. And so that school that is in that community, the Kayon High School Best, that has a website, is an organization that seeks to really support the school, even at this point in time. And I want to encourage that all alumni here in St. Kitts and Nevis continue to support their school in whatever way they can, be it financial, be it to mentor, be it to go and help to paint up if you need to paint up, change some tiles if you can do that, cut, help cut the yard if you can, so that the community can really take ownership of our schools here in St. Kitts and Nevis. And so I want to really congratulate CH Kayon High School best and what they have been doing um, thus far. Madam Speaker, I just wanted to highlight those two critical things and to thank my colleagues who have been working so tremendously hard over the time. But I also want to thank you, Madam Speaker, you and your good offices, the clerk who is here, the deputy clerk who came on and is you know, getting into stride with his work, those on the opposite side, because without them, this process cannot be, um, cannot be had. A democracy is made up of government and those on the opposite, opposition bench. I want to thank all of the officers who are here. But I want to also thank here our um, professionals in sign language, Madam Speaker. Last year, I had the opportunity to meet with the deaf community. And I think Honorable Congress Maynard has a relative of the deaf community. And what they said to me in their language being translated is that parliament is taking place, laws are being passed that are affecting their lives, 
and they don't know what these laws are. They can't hear the debate. Maybe they can read it subsequently, but they can't hear the debate to understand how these laws would impact their lives. And so for the first time, again, in keeping with our principle of a sustainable island state where all citizens, irrespective of their background, especially if they have any disability, that that would not be an impediment. Because I've learned that a disability is really only a disability if we don't create the environment for those persons who are perceived to have the disability to function normally. Because when we went, and we met with the professionals, and you can see them here all the time doing an excellent job, translating what we say into sign language. That, of course, brings our people, those of the deaf community, to be a part and parcel of the whole process of parliamentary, parliamentary debate and participating more wholesomely in our democracy. So I'm very proud. I feel good when I look at this on the TV and I see in a little square box there the sign language taking place. But as speaker, I can tell you, one day walking down the road, and I... My attention was drawn because somebody was there, they, you know, they made a sound and they moved their hand in a particular way. And they run up to me smiling, two of them, two young ladies, and I really could not say. But I picked up one of them saying, thank you, you know, because again, they had the opportunity now to participate. And we responded to them and we heard them. And so I want to thank our interpreters for being a robust part of our parliamentary proceedings as well to thank the audience, Madam Speaker. And I'm doing this because it's a year now. And to thank the media for making sure that the message get out to our people. And to finally say that in a democracy, and now in the era of good governance, that to have more participation in this process is our aim. And that is why we are taking the budget for the first time on the road. More participation means a stronger democracy, means the attainment of a sustainable island state, means better living for all of us here in St. Kitts and Nevis. That is the promise of this administration to our people, and we are working tirelessly hard to make sure that we stick to what we promise. Thank you, Madam Speaker. May it please you. Thank you to the Honorable Member for St. Christopher 18. I recognize the Honorable Member for St. Christopher 3. I would like to take this opportunity to move that this House stands adjourned, sign and dying. Is there a second? Madam Speaker, I wish to second that Madam motion. Speaker, Madam Speaker, the, the, the session, I, the Madam your mic. Yes, I would want to make a brief statement at this closing juncture, Madam Speaker. Basically, it is to extend all best wishes to those in our jurisdiction who are suffering as a result of breast cancer. It certainly is a terrible burden to bear, and I have known several persons who have fallen victim to this particular illness. And so, as we and other countries set out to remember this particular illness, the pervasiveness of it, we would want and I would want as a leader of the People's Labour Party and as a member of parliament to say we stand in solidarity with all the victims of cancer and in particular at this time as we pay particular focus to those who are suffering from breast cancer. As a former student of the Kayan High School, I've had several discussions with the organizing committee. In fact, there are several committees at this time, at least two I am aware of, that are doing special projects for the school. And I would want to joined in commending all the alumni, wherever they are, to make their contribution in this regard. And finally, to extend a word of sympathy to the family of Stanley Franks, a noted trade unionist 
noted sportsman and a patriot at large. And as they grieve at this particular time, the loss of someone so patriotic, so hardworking and committed to duty, I would want the family to be aware that they have my personal sympathies and support. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for facilitating. Thank you to the Honorable Member for St. Christopher 7. May we have the motion again, please? Honorable Speaker, I rise to move a motion to have this House adjourn signed dying. Is there a second now? I rise, Madam Speaker, to second the motion. The question is that this House be adjourned signed die. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. House stands adjourned. Sign a die.